Hello and welcome everyone to tonight's MHPM webinar, Suicide Ideation in Primary School Aged Children. And welcome to the over 1,600 people of you who are logged in already to this webinar. Uh, my understanding is that MHPN have had uh, unprecedented amount of uh, interest in this webinar, so we look forward to being able to bring this to you. MHPN would uh, also like to acknowledge that uh, the traditional custodians of the land, seas and waterways across Australia, upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay respects to the elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. Please also note that we acknowledge that suicidal ideation for uh, Aboriginal young children uh, is an issue which um, is very serious and also overrepresented. Uh, but we don't feel that tonight we would be able to do that specific issue justice um, and so it won't be covered specifically in tonight's webinar. However, if you do have an interest in this area, uh, the Western Australia Coroner recently delivered a report relating to an inquest into the deaths of 13 children and young people in the Kimberley region. So that might be something that you're interested in reading. So um, my name's Dan Moss, I'm the Workforce Development Manager at Emerging Minds, we're a national workforce centre for children's mental health under 12 years age. So this is something, uh, this webinar tonight, something that I'm uh, really um, interested in and um, looking forward to hearing from each of our presenters. Before we start, a self-care message. Uh, the purpose of this webinar is to give health professionals the skills they need so they can help people work more effectively with children and their parents in the future. Personal stories of illness are very important and MHPN often includes consumers and carers on our panels. The chat box that will operate tonight, however, is not a forum for personal stories. Uh, it is designed to complement the panel discussion by allowing professionals to share resources and their experiences of practice. So thank you for respecting this. But if any of tonight's contact does, uh, content does cause distress, please seek care. And if you require, uh, contact Beyond Blue on 1300 22 4636 or contact your local GP or local mental health service. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce tonight's very exciting panel. Uh, and firstly, I'd like to welcome Dr. Lynn O'Grady, uh, who's a psychologist in Victoria. And Lynn, what we'd like to know first of all is how you became interested uh, in this topic. Thanks, Dan, and it's great to be here. And hi, everyone. I've um, been thinking about when did I start thinking and working in, in the space, and it goes back a couple of decades, actually, probably 25 years ago when I started working with parents and, and parents of teenagers who um, had teenagers with a whole lot of issues, and suicide was one of those. And a few years ago, I just it just kept cropping up in, in lots of work that I was doing, whether it was working in schools or um, supervising psychology interns that I that I do, it kept coming up. So a few years ago, I decided I should tackle it a bit more head on. So I, I undertook the Master of Suicidology through Griffith University, and I, I did that. That was a three year program, and and it's such an interesting, challenging, difficult topic that it just keeps me, keeps me interested. So it's been a kind of a bit of a lifelong interest, really, that, that is still there. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. And while we have you here, um, we just mentioned the WA coroner's report um, in the Kimberleys. Um, have you got any comment or any observations you'd like to make about that? Yeah, I've been reading. I saw that that came out last week, and I was very conscious that it was very timely in terms of tonight's um, webinar. And um, have been working my way through the report. It's a very long, several hundred pages of report, mm -hmm. and there are sections that are that are very relevant, and we'll pick up on some of those tonight. But I, I think the main the main issue that comes through is there's um, Aboriginal kids and um, adults, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders are always overrepresented in, in stats, and there are some specific elements in terms of the lives of, of kids in the Kimberley that come through and are, and are written about and the coroner reported upon. 
Um, but there are also some things that, that are relevant across the board as well. So the great challenge, I guess, is how do we how do we do justice for all all children and young people and, and adults? But how do we particularly understand the complexities with that overlay of, in terms of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, needs? And and that this panel isn't the panel to do that. It needs to be done in collaboration and, yeah. and co-designed and led by Aboriginal um, communities. So yeah, it's important that we acknowledge that. But we also know that there are um, children, young people who are impacted, and adults as well from non-Indigenous backgrounds who um, are impacted as well. So we all need to work together. Yeah, thank you for that answer, Lynn. Um, much appreciated. Our next uh, panelist tonight is Dr. Andrew Leach, uh, who's going to be providing us with their GP's perspective. Andrew, when we're considering a case study like that of Joshua, um, and we're developing a mental health plan with him, what other professionals do you consider important to include? Thanks Dan. Well, the obvious uh, professional we normally include is the psychologist um, and that um, is someone who's obviously very important um, who we refer to uh, quite often on the mental health care plan but we also have a lot of other important health professionals that we can include on a mental health plan and who are funded, um, such as an occupational therapist who can also do mental health uh, work with our patients, especially our paediatric patients and who have a lot of skills to offer, um, and also social workers who can um, help and support us on a mental health plan. So um, depending on what the child and parent might be interested in, in um, uh, dealing with and what problems might arise, we can utilise lots of different um, health professionals um, and there's so many programs out there now that we can incorporate on the mental health plans that might involve group therapy for kids um, or different social skill programs for kids, for kids with low self-esteem um, or trouble with schooling. Um, and so these different allied health professionals can be really helpful with those and we incorporate them on the plan. And then there's also online programs as well that I often put on the plan to make sure that they're um, included as well. Um, they're not obviously funded in the program, but they're good to utilise um, and, and remind parents about. Thank you, Andrew. In summary, I guess um, psychologist our next panel tonight is Dr. Hugh Kim Lee, um, who's a psycho psychiatrist. Um, Kim, can you tell us, uh, in terms of suicide ideation, is medication uh, for children helpful or useful? Hi there, Dan. Thanks for that. As a child and adolescent psychiatrist, it's really important that we do a thorough assessment and come up with a formulation that informs our management plan. And as a child and psychiatrist, the, net, the, the question of medication often comes up, but it's definitely not at the forefront of my mind in terms of treatment. Obviously, if it's a mild to moderate uh, severity, uh, we're looking at more therapeutic solution and managing uh, it through non-pharmacological means, but if we've come up with a diagnosis and formulation that is looking at a more of a biological uh, cause or contribution to their suicidality and their mental state, then medication would be useful in that situation. Thank you, Kim. Our final presenter tonight is uh, Ellen Sinclair. Ellen is a, a mental health nurse. Um, Ellen, in your role, um, do you receive many referrals for young children who are having suicidal thoughts? Um, I think we might have just um, lost Ellen there, so um, we might um, move on to the uh, come back to Ellen uh, at a later stage. So um, let's uh, talk a little bit about the, the ground rules tonight, um, and particularly in the webinar platform. So we have um, about 2,100 uh, people logged in at the moment. So there's going to be quite a lot of traffic in the in the ch general chat room. Uh, the, the chat box is for general chat amongst other health professionals. Uh, so if you have a question um, that can't be asked through the, the chat board, please submit a question tab. 
Uh, also, there will be slides and resources uh, that are connected to the webinar in that tab. If you have um, any uh, technical issues, please click the technical support FAQs tab for help with your technical issues. There is a number to call if, the, if the, you are still having uh, difficulties. And if every participant is having difficulties, you'll be alerted by an announcement. In terms of learning outcomes, uh, so tonight through an exploration of suicide ideation in primary school age children, this webinar will pro provide participants with the opportunity to identify factors that are likely to increase the risk of suicidal thoughts in primary school children, implement a referral pathway that allows the development of a collaborative mental health plan for primary school aged children who have suicidal ideation, and describe protective factors within families, schools and communities that can assist prevention of suicide ideation in primary school aged children. So now we're going to move on to Lynn's presentation uh, and then we'll be talking about uh, suicide ideation from a psychologist's perspective. Welcome Lynn. Thanks Dan. I um, just want to think about the first initial thoughts I guess when we think about child suicide and I guess acknowledge that the thought of a child dying by suicide is a, is a confronting one. It certainly challenges ideas that we might hold about how children grow and develop. So we still have ideas around childhood as being a, a time of um, happiness, a time in life where you don't have so many worries, but it, it can be challenging to hear that children can be so distressed or their life being so, so difficult that, that suicide enters into, into their mind. Um, there's lots of debate and in the coroner's report as well, the WA report that's just come out, there is a, there's quite a bit that's talked about in terms of children's understandings of death and their capacity to have the intent to suicide. And that can leave people with questions around is it actually suicide, was it an accident? And the coroner does look into that and is very clear and does make the determination that of the 13 um, deaths, that 12 of them were um, were suicide, one that had an open finding. So she does talk about that. And it really comes back to some of the research that was done back in the 90s actually in terms of children's understandings of death. And, and there was certainly um, ideas then that children from about the age of eight can certainly understand the permanence of death. And so it's, it's fair to, to then understand that, that they can understand um, suicide. So it's, it's an area of, um, we still need to understand further, but certainly um, something that's useful for us to think about. And, and I guess not let us get in the way of minimising or, or not, not taking it seriously, I guess is, is a really important message. There are a lot of questions in the registration about statistics and what do we know and what don't we know. And I deliberately put in what don't we know yet because there's a lot we don't know. In fact, the stats for children between 5 and 14 only started to, in Australia to be counted um, several years ago, so 2011 they started to be reported. So if we look at last year's statistics from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, 98 deaths by suicide occurred in 2017 in the age group 5 to 17 years and most of those were in the older age group. Uh, and 2017 suicide in Australia remained the leading cause of death of children between 5 and 17 years of age and that was representing a 10% increase in deaths from the year before and there was an overall 9% in deaths overall in that year. There's lots of caution that we need to take around that because it's not, um, it's not great news at all that, that the deaths are increasing, but it's not that simple either. There are, there are sometimes differences across um, states and territories and a whole lot of factors that come into how, how the suicide is determined and there are different coronial processes and different awareness that, that impact on that. So we have to be careful and there's certainly recommendations these days that we look at rather than year by year, we actually look at blocks of three to five years to look at patterns and that's some of the international discussions that are happening. Um, it's hopeless trying to compare um, internationally, it's even quite hard across states and territories to compare stats because they're, they're just not done in the same way. So we need to have a lot of caution. I guess that, that then brings us to what do we know about younger children and so the um, Australian Bureau of Statistics has looked at um, the period 2010 to 2014 and that's where it's been able to break down that younger age group, age of 5 to 14, 88 deaths in that, that time. And you can see there that they were pretty equal in terms of males and females and that's quite different to adult population. You might be aware that, that typically in adult populations and, and even young adults that it's usually more males dying of suicide, females attempt suicide more but males um, are usually um, dying more from suicide. So it's quite different in children. So I think one of the challenges is to think about this, this in a little bit differently to how we might be thinking about in adults, that we can't just make the same assumptions about that. 
Some of the things to flag, this is probably an underestimation, but that there's probably more that would be guessed, but there's some doubt about it, or there are reasons why it hasn't been called a suicide for children. So it's probably underestimation, and that would fit with what we know in terms of suicide ideation and attempt. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander are more um, likely um, to die by suicide. We've talked about that already. Um, and if we just look at the hard, cold statistics, as opposed to thinking about suicide as individuals and the devastation around that, Statistically speaking, we're talking about small numbers, which also make it difficult to make any, any real claims or draw a whole lot of conclusions for it. So it's a source of data that, that in many ways is, is doesn't give us a whole lot to, to work with. Um, but we certainly know that thoughts and talk about suicide is much more common, which is why we're all here. Um, in terms of the case study, I think it's useful always to think about the Brenner social ecological model. I'm a community psychologist, so I, I always think about things in this way. So children particularly developing within the context of relationships and the family being the most significant influence on children's mental health. And we certainly see that in the case study with Joshua. So he's, he does seem to be very impacted significantly by his family circumstances and reports feeling left out and unimportant, believing that no one cares about him. And he's experienced a lot of change on the death of his father. And, and changing family circumstances, which would fit with, with what we might think about in terms of risk and protective factors. There are protective factors there, but there are, there are also some, some things that have happened that could be considered risk factors as well. Now, I squeezed a lot of information onto this, this slide. This is some data that was, um, came out of the Kids Helpline that your town um, did some analysis of. And this, is, this came out a couple of year or two ago now. And I remember at the time thinking this should be something we should be hearing more about. And it wasn't heard about as much as, as I thought it would be. And there are reports there. I'll put the link there for you. You might like to read some more. But some of the things just to, to look at here is that the Kids Helpline people were saying that they, they regularly get, get calls from children under 14 who are talking about um, suicide and, and do ring in relation to concerns around suicide. And that can be from, from quite a young age, seven and up. They also talk about the, asking the question around whether or not they've made a suicide plan or have had an attempt at suicide. You can see there the statistics, and it's not just the older kids, it's actually a number of the younger ones as well. And then the biggest worry, and I guess the biggest message for me tonight, is did you receive help when you were thinking about suicide? And you can see there that 74% of the, the children under 14 didn't receive help. So they were asked, trying to get help or asking people for help, and they weren't getting it. So that says a lot, I think, in terms of what one thing we can do is, is to um, be ready to offer some help. I think the other thing that's useful, and there are various theories that, that crop up, but this is a couple that I, I quite like that I thought are worth sharing. And, and the, the um, graph there is from Wasserman and Wasserman, 2012. And I, I kind of think about there's opportunities to intervene. And you can see there that it's, it shows these observed behaviours related to suicide above the line and then non-observed behaviours below the line. So suicide ideation and thoughts of suicide and even the planning can be happening under the line. And it's only when it tips up and comes above the line that a child might say something or show something or say that they're, they're um, feeling suicidal or, or attempting suicide in some way that it becomes observable. And if people don't pick up on that, well then it can, it can go down again or it can come back up again depending on what happens and then it can go down that trajectory. So um, of course suicide might happen impulsively as well, but, but this is sort of a pattern that I think is useful for us to be ready for. So thinking about what's going on below that line I think is a really important message. And I think from the case study we can certainly see that Joshua was feeling invisible and alienated and he did speak to the, the family doctor and, and I guess my view is that now it's time we know that, we're above the line, we can do something about that. When it's below the line it's harder to deal with. Another research article that I found that I thought was also really useful came out of the United Kingdom last year and it's Dunkley and some others that um, did some research with young adults who were actually suicidal, they were in, in hospital and they found that there were four groups in terms of the experiences of these patients in terms of expressing their emotional pain to somebody else, including health professionals, which is always confronting to hear as well as a health professional. And they found these four groups. So there was the unspoken and unheard experience where it, wasn't, it was all below the line and it wasn't spoken and no one noticed and so people felt invisible, alienated, wordless is the description. The second group where it was spoken, so it became above the line, observed, but it was unheard. So it was spoken but didn't, no one picked up on it, which is a bit like what we're hearing from the kids' helpline data, that children are trying to reach out and get some help and, and not um, getting it. So people can feel depersonalised, distracted. The third one is spoken and heard, where people can speak it and they're heard and acknowledged. 
And the fourth one, where it's probably the best one, where it's unspoken but heard. So it's, it's below the line and um, people are still hearing it, noticing behaviours, noticing subtleties, noticing changes. So I think we're in a good position to do that. And I'll just finish off by, I think, the other sort of thing to think about. We always have to be thinking about working with families when we're talking about children and we have to think about how that might impact on them. We might be the person who is going to share with the family that this is what's happening or the family might be in, in coming to see us in terms of realising this is quite serious. And so looking at this study which looked at the experiences and you can see there the vast experiences that parents can have when, when their child is this is teenagers but when their child has experienced um, suicidality and suicide attempts. So it's important I think to think about that when we're, we're trying to provide some support and wondering why people are not wanting to hear what we've got to say or seem like they're not, not really doing what we want them to do. So I think that's important to hear as well. And I'll stop there, Dan, thanks. Thanks very much, Lynn. That was a yeah, really uh, comprehensive presentation. Thank you for that. Um, our next uh, presenter tonight uh, is Dr Andrew Leach. Uh, Andrew, welcome and uh, um, look forward to your presentation. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I think with Joshua, the first challenge is engaging him in a general practice setting and a healthcare setting as a whole. And that is perhaps one of the biggest challenges, um, is trying to help him to adapt to that healthcare setting and finding a way in to help him to express his emotions. 11-year-olds uh, or 10-year-olds or even children in general probably do have trouble voicing their emotions. and. So I try to work out a way to build that rapport. It might be just sitting and listening, um, starting off with mum and getting mum in to talk to her about what has been happening with Joshua and having a bit of an access to, that way to then be able to relate to Joshua and his world or age appropriate language with Joshua, uh, talking a bit about his world in terms of um, what, what football team he goes for, what sports he enjoys, what computer games he is playing just so that you can make him feel more comfortable in this setting. Uh, and I, I think from there, um, accessing a little bit more deeper into his emotional state. 11-year-olds um, and 10-year-olds think they're coming to the GP or into the healthcare setting for coughs and colds and broken bones. They don't necessarily think they're coming in here to talk about depression and anxiety, which are quite heavy topics, let alone suicidal thoughts. So um, that is the first thing before we start to break into more difficult discussions and, and that's what I want to start with. It actually takes a lot of patience and a lot of time and an investment of time which will pay off later. Um, moving on to the next sort of deeper issues which is a big buzzword at the moment which is resilience and um, what has broken that resilience for Joshua. Uh, it's been a bit of a disequilibrium for him, more negatives than positives really, a breakdown in some of his family situation, um, the loss of his father, um, leading on to a real loss of contact with some of his real positive influences such as his grandparents and spending more time isolated in his, with his technology, losing touch with some of the outside experiences such as playing basketball and sports and then some of the school, I would like to know a little bit more about his school and, and, and what is happening at school. You know, we know bullying is a big impact on um, mental health and depression and, and uh, you know, it can, can lead on to suicidal thoughts. So asking these questions about how is your world going, how is school and how is home and just some open-ended questions can really help us to understand Joshua more and what has led to that disbalance with his resilience and his understanding of what's been happening. I guess the big job for us in GP um, is to assess his risk and I wanted to give this some time in the slides. Assessing risk is difficult uh, and we have to um, be very careful I guess with how we word things. Uh, with kids it's not always easy. I would probably gauge with how I've been going along with the consult as to how I might do that. Sometimes it's, um, you know, it needs to be developmentally sensitive so I mean you know, if, if he's a younger child we might use different words. We might say you know, look there's some really big difficult topics we've talked about today. Um, and you've mentioned to mum that you're feeling really depressed and, and you're feeling like you want to end your life. What do you mean by that? So we ask him to word it in his own words. If he's not opening up to me, I would ask him to draw a picture and pictures can be very powerful and I've had many kids bring in pictures that show a lot of explanation um, so, uh, about how they're actually going. Um, so pictures or, or writing or um, discussion um, 
if it's a very serious risk situation, they might be having a knife under their pillow or they might be having a rope under their pillow and we really need to act on that here and now. If it's a less serious situation, they might be describing that they don't want to wake up in the morning because their world is, is caving in. So we can get a quick assessment of how he's going and what he actually means by death and dying and getting an understanding of that. And I think that's the crucial thing for Josh and, 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 his, and what he means by he wanted, he's wanting to kill himself. So, and then working collaboratively and inclusively, um, what I mean is we really try to, trying to get his family on board, trying to get his school on board and get that collaborative approach, get, get the whole team on board because the more people we have together as a team, the better this will be, the better outcome it will be for Josh. Um, uh, it's harder just doing this one-on-one -on -one and, and if we can get Joshua to accept that, then it'll be much easier for all of us. Um, I'm always thinking about other medical causes. It's great if we can just check in on his health, check in on um, any secondary causes that might be contributing. Obviously looking at diet and sleep, um, it's always important to, to think about whether he's sleeping properly, whether there's any sleep apnea, whether he's eating well, looking at his meals, doing some blood tests for iron and, and considering imaging and then technology is obviously having a bit of an impact on him uh, which um, we'll hear about a bit later and other things such as ADHD or autism and screening for those um, in a secondary test or, or as in doing some screening questionnaires and sending him off to a paediatrician or a developmental paediatrician. Um, finally, the management of Joshua. Now, this is probably going to take follow-up and, and I'm happy if, if it's acute enough to see him straight away the next day or to organise an, an urgent follow-up appointment, um, book, block off another appointment that day if we have to because this obviously takes priority. A mental health care plan is probably the next step for Joshua to get him um, onto seeing psychologists, as I mentioned, or an occupational therapist. Um, support for mum and family and, and getting mum back to see her separately. She needs her own set of um, her own help. 24-7 contact numbers I've got printed here and I would hand them straight on to her, which would be Kids Helpline. I've mentioned Headspace here because we know that they offer services for, for young people, but if she they wants to, she could also source some private psychologists um, and the Child and Men uh, Adolescent Mental Health Services locally um, which can offer private psychiatry or um, other advice to GPs who might be um, you know, able to help, um, help with a plan and, and follow up for Joshua. And I think that really important thing of safety netting and close follow up, telling mum and Joshua that we are here for him, we're here to support him and, and we are happy to see him as regularly as he needs to um, in, a, in a really supportive non-judgmental way so that he can have that regular close contact. Thank you, Andrew. Um, uh, that was a really uh, really great presentation and um, it's great to um, hear GPs such as yourself engaging so well with, um, with children and families. So thank you so much for that, that was excellent. Um, our next uh, presenter is Ellen Sinclair. Ellen, um, we have some technical issues to start with, I apologise about that. Um, but as an introductory question, we were just uh, interested to know, um, do you receive many referrals for young children who are having suicidal thoughts in your role? I was very close to the high school. I was very close to the GP and get a lot of these sorts of presentations, not necessarily having talked about suicide, but of course someone who is so depressed, uh, who presents as depressed with the history that has, uh, that is a very special uh, Yes, I have had uh, young people who have I'm thinking I'm continuing on. Um, so um, uh, Ellen, we might just leave you there uh, for the minute. We're just having some sound difficulties. Uh, sorry about that again uh, for the technical issues. We'll um, see if we can resolve those and get back to you. So we might now go to Dr Hugh Kim Lee who's going to um, give us uh, his perspective as a, as a child psychiatrist um, Kim, um, uh, if you'd like to uh, start your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. So I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist based 
here in Adelaide, South Australia. And as a CAM psychiatrist, I guess we are seeing children who are the most at risk and vulnerable. And usually they've seen quite a few other clinicians beforehand. So I think in terms of basic principles, it's important to remember that communication between the multidisciplinary uh, clinicians is really important. And for GPs and psychologists, if you are making a referral to a psychiatrist, it would be helpful for you to send any reports or information that would support the assessment. In terms of, in a CAM setting, a lot of the time people get caught up in terms of risk categorization. And I did my training in New South Wales, so I had a lot of influence from Chris Ryan and Matthew Large, who did a lot of studies and looked at the evidence with regards to risk categorization. I just want to say a caveat that there are some limitations to risk categorization and uh, saying that someone is at high risk shouldn't replace a thorough assessment formulation and treatment plan. In terms of a clinical assessment in the CAM setting, suicidal ideation is a common presentation, but completed suicide is rare. As a psychiatrist, I would be interested in, did Joshua have any past history of suicide attempts? And does he meet the clinical criteria for a mental illness? For example, does he have the hopelessness, the worthlessness, the excessive guilt of a major depressive disorder? And those are the main things that I'd be assessing to look at in terms of understanding his suicidal ideation. And does he have any current plans to end his life? Does he have a method? Does he have suicide notes? Other interesting questions might be, what is keeping him alive? What are his protective factors? Does he want to die or does he want to just disappear because of the emotional difficulties that he might be having in his life? In a CAM setting, our priority groups are children who are under the guardianship of the minister and Aboriginal and Indigenous populations because they are at most risk. In terms of looking at questions around his family and de developmental history, I'd be looking at his family history, is there a family history of mental illness and suicide attempts? His father passed away when he was quite young. I'd be interested to know if his father actually committed suicide and whether he is aware of the cause of his father's death. Are there reports from his psychologist that he saw after six sessions and what were the reasons why he stopped the sessions and did he find these sessions useful? What happened developmentally? Did his mother have postnatal depression and did that affect his early attachment? Was he a planned pregnancy? Were there any other medical complications? How were his milestones? And what is his relationship like with Travis? It appears a distant in the story that was presented to us. And have they considered medication? Have they talked about this with their GP already, has the GP specifically asked for us to consider medication? Has he seen a psychologist recently and has the therapy not been as effective? In terms of a working clinical formulation from the history that was presented to me, I felt that Joshua was a 10-year-old male who presented with a past history of major depression he is showing signs of a relapse of his depressive disorder with poor concentration, more withdrawn and poor social connection. There have been a loss of his usual activities and I suspect that there is a biological predisposition to a mental illness from his family history of his mother drinking and a big question mark about his father. In addition to the loss of his father, there have been other multiple losses, loss of his parentified role in the family, loss of connection with his mother, and a loss of connection with his paternal grandparents. I do also wonder if he is using online games as a means to escape and seek connection, and I'd like to explore this further. And online gaming is a specific interest of mine, and there have been uh, federal national surveys in Australia that show the strong link between online gaming time and depressive symptoms. From a psychiatrist's perspective discussing antidepressants, would I prescribe antidepressants for Joshua? Well, 
with the information presented in front of me unlikely. I probably wouldn't prescribe based on this information and without a current mental state examination. I think as a psychiatrist it's very key that we do document how we saw him in the clinic session and I would always prefer to have a try at a psychological therapy first and if there's no improvement then I would consider a combination with a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor such as fluoxetine which is shown the most evidence. In terms of the side effect profile you'd want to start with a low dose and consider the side effects that would affect his tolerability and adherence to medication but also there is a concern that there is a black box warning that there is an increased risk of agitation and increased suicidal ideation when starting an antidepressant in a person under the age of 18. So I'm fairly conservative in my prescribing of antidepressants in primary school age children but Certainly in teenagers, this is something that I would uh, consider. And in our CAM setting, we have actually have a policy now that we must, as a prescriber, if we do prescribe an antidepressant, that we must see them within the two weeks of commencement to minimize any concerns with regards to suicidality and risk due to starting a medication. And also, I, li I also like to refer to the Black Dog Institute of uh, in their guide in terms of prescribing for teens, which I think is um, quite handy and often send this information to the GP. So thanks. Thanks for that, Kim. That was a uh, yeah, really great presentation. And uh, we've got many questions for you popping up on the uh, chat box. So lots of interest in um, some of your work there. So thank you. Okay, so we're going to go back to Ellen and check that the um, technical issues have been resolved. Um, Ellen, are you uh, you're back? I'm hoping so. Oh, you sound beautiful. That's uh, okay. much better. Um, <laughs> so uh, welcome back uh, for the third Thank time, you. and uh, let's uh, let's move on with your presentation. Um, thanks for bearing with us. All right, no worries. Uh, there, there's been a lot of fabulous information already given, so I'll just be very specific talking about my role uh, as I perform it in the uh, primary care setting. As I said, I work very closely with the GP. Um, I would also be working very closely with Joshua and his mum. Uh, so we would be talking about um, talking about what what their needs are. Uh, I would be building, of course, building rapport with both of them, trying to get a good idea of what has happened in the past with any counselling that's been attempted. Um, I think there's two particular points I want to address. It's basically safety, which has been talked a little bit about, um, but also keeping him engaged in treatment because I, I see that as a, as a major part of my role. Um, in, in conversation with his mum, I certainly validate her very much in her the difficulties they've had since she lost her husband as a family at her uh, at her great work at keeping the family together um, the role that her new husband has played uh, so giving them lots of validation because there's no doubt she will be feeling the effects of now having a, a depressed and uh, suicidal child which would really impact on, on her and the rest of the family. So lots of validation there and talking about what I can help with um, in my position in conjunction with the GP. So as part of the safety of course, going through, you can read there on the slide, um, I would generally err on the side of safety in conjunction with the GP and we would refer this, um, refer Joshua to CAMS or the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service um, and certainly psychological intervention would be uh, required. It has been tried before and, and concluded after three sessions. I would certainly have a conversation with him about that, find out what the issues might be. Um, there could be all sorts of reasons. Uh, so, you know, getting getting a good idea from him why that didn't continue would be a step in the right direction to try and uh, keep him involved in therapy this time. So, some of the things listed there will certainly go through. 
Um, I would I would be led by him. I would be led by how much he wanted to talk, um, and also giving him uh, some choices. Uh, some of the, the initial part of the conversation would certainly be with him and his mother. Uh, generally, mums are very very keen to allow their children to be alone because they're sort of hoping they'll come out with lots of stuff that they haven't uh, felt they can talk to her about. So, um, but then there would always be uh, five minutes or so at the end of the session uh, and asking his permission as far as what we, I can share with his mum. Um, being clear about some of the stuff, especially around his safety, I can't keep secret, of course. So uh, that would be the, the bulk of what I would uh, talk to him about. Um, collaborative goal setting, asking him what he wants. Uh, unless you ask, you don't know. Uh, talk to it, discuss with his mum about individual versus family therapy. Start to sound her out around family therapy because she's there thinking, you know, he's got the problem, he needs the help. Uh, but maybe having a conversation about perhaps the family needs a bit of assistance. Um, and even if, and, and it depends on what services are available. They differ throughout Australia. Uh, so somewhere metropolitan area or regional area, like here I am in Newcastle, I have reasonable access to services. Uh, some areas the access isn't good at all. So uh, that certainly would um, be part of the conversation. Um, and also ongoing monitoring. So Again, family GP, the family is very likely to be quite well connected already. But having that open door and uh, sort of saying to mum, if he's not keen to keep involved, if he's not keen to continue with whichever therapist or service he's with, so please bring him back so we can have a bit of a conversation about that and see what, see if we can get to the bottom of it, see if there's some new information that he might be forthcoming with. Uh, because of the family dynamics, he may not be receptive to opening up to mum and, and his stepdad um, at home very much at all. Again, school involvement, all of those things, as Andrew mentioned before, all the people in his life need to be involved and on the same page with uh, creating a, a protective team around Joshua and, uh, and trying to lessen that feeling of being not heard and feeling abandoned. Uh, so as a mental health nurse in a, in a primary care practice, that would be my two things, uh, primarily looking at, um, at safety and, uh, and also keeping him engaged in whatever treatment we um, supported him into because there'd be no doubt that he would need ongoing treatment um, from the initial assessment that we've given him. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, you speak uh, quite a bit there about uh, collaborative goal setting uh, with the family. Um, Ashley uh, in the chat room has asked the question around, how do you suggest practitioners engage parents in the therapeutic process with children like Joshua, uh, where parents are resistant or uh, not very keen to attend sessions? Where parents are not keen? Yeah. Yeah, look, that's a real challenge. Um, I think what goes well in this situation is mum is there. Mum is a bit stuck in the middle um, as he has a stepdad. She's the mother of Joshua. Mm -hmm. So I would, be, I would be taking that as a really positive thing and I think really validating the obvious care and concern and that she's already seeking treatment. Um, so yeah, look, you've got to look for the strength and uh, if stepdad isn't keen because that's the most likely scenario, yeah. you can have family therapy with whatever family members are available, give them strategies to move, go back to their family and try and put into place. Right. Thanks so much, Ellen. Um, Andrew, a question for you from Cathy. Um, and there's quite a few uh, similar questions like this in the chat room at the moment. Um, Question around, does uh, suicidal ideation mean that a report must be made immediately um, to child protection or um, even that a child um, should be prevented from leaving um, a professional premises? Uh, 
a very good question. I wouldn't think that's the case with ideation and I would need to assess their, I, I think getting a really good understanding of what they, again, what their understanding and what their meaning of um, what they're actually trying to say to you in terms of what they mean by they want to kill themselves, getting it in their terms and getting in their description, as I said. So if they um, have an active plan and if they are really quite definite about it, then I think we do need to get um, some action in place. But child protection I, 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 is a state-by-state -state, um, law and, and, and so each state probably has its own um, uh, regulation around that area um, and you would have to look that up in each state um, uh, in, in terms of um, how to um, how to approach that topic. Um, if there was an immediate problem in terms of the um, Joshua saying that he was at risk and he was looking at you know having a um, going home and not feeling safe, um, I would probably um, say that we need to send him straight to hospital for an assessment um, so that he could be supported um, and that might involve mum, uh, if mum is able to take him, we would utilise that. Um, if, if she was feeling overwhelmed by the whole situation, um, would we involve um, uh, certifying, you know, getting some kind of an ambulance to to be involved, or you know, you try not to escalate these situations because that just makes the whole matter worse. I think so. Where possible, um, I would um, use um, de-escalation and and you know, trying to um, talk to Josh about whether he, we can do close follow up and really try to help him through the situation without having to go to that stage. Uh, but um, uh, Kim might have, be able to also help with that as well. I don't know mm. if he has any other ideas around that. Uh, Kim, um, would you like to, yep. to comment on that? Uh, yeah, sure. I think it's a poorly worded question and that it means that the person who asked the question didn't really consider that each individual case is case by case basis and that su suicidal ideation, although it should be taken seriously, if you do have any doubts, by all means, call an ambulance and send them to the hospital for an expert opinion. But I guess it comes down to how comfortable you are and your clinical experience and it's that balance between knowing where you are in terms of how comfortable you are sending them home and your clinical judgment and taking it case by case basis and I guess managing the risk and managing resources as well. Thank you, Kim. Um, so while we have you, um, there's been some uh, real interest in your uh, much of your presentation, but particularly around um, uh, you, the uh, material you talked about on gaming and social media. Yeah. Do you see gaming and social media as influencing of children's thoughts about suicide? Yeah, definitely. I think Instagram CEO recently just came out to say that they are going to start banning self-harm images on Instagram because there have been some well publicized events where there were essentially uh, children affected by social media and in terms of my own experience in the southern Adelaide region there was a widely publicized uh, traumatic death in the area of a young person who had experienced cyberbullying and we definitely increase experience an increase in presentation and the schools and the school wellbeing counsellors experience the increase in presentation. And that would reflect the research on cluster suicides and what we call a contagion effect, where people relate to the stories on the news. If it's the same gender, the same age, then they might have increased suicidal ideation or be triggered, essentially. And the research would say that when newspapers go on strike, then there are decreased suicidal presentations or suicidal episodes. So it's, that's why there are very clear journalistic guidelines in terms of what 
uh, put out into the public. And I guess social media does not currently have those responsibilities in place. I think uh, Australia has started to put some laws in, but um, certainly the Instagram CEO uh, making a stance on reducing and eliminating self-harm uh, images is a step forward. In terms of gaming, that's a whole other kettle of fish, but I don't think we have time to speak about that today. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Um, Lynn, a question from you, from uh, Jason. Um, What's the difference between a safety plan for an adult and a safety plan for a child? That's a good question, Jane. I think we don't have a lot of information around safety plans for children, so there's not a lot of research that I've seen around that. But safety planning is certainly the evidence-based practice at the moment for responding to a person who presents with suicide ideation or plans. And I think you would apply the same principle. So the idea of a safety plan is that you're addressing a whole lot of things that are that are happening around the person. So, what are the when are the, the suicide ideation, the thoughts, the plan? When are they likely to happen, and what are the triggers for that? So, I think you could do that with children. If there's a plan, or they've got ideas around what they would actually do, what their plan is, well, then you you'd reduce the means. So, you'd want to identify that as well, and, and have a plan around that. And you'd want parents to be heavily involved in this as well. You'd want to have some plans in the, in the safety plan also about when they do feel these um, thoughts coming on or when they're, they're feeling stressed and hopefully the earlier they're starting to recognise those signs the better and then you'd look at well what can you do, how do you how do you manage those, do you talk to somebody, do you ring, talk to family hopefully, if you're in a school what would that look like and you'd need the plan to be tailored to, um, to the school and the home situation. So I think you get the same principles of, um, of the safety plan that you would use with adults. You'd obviously tailor it, as I think Andrew was talking about, listening to the child's language, how, what, what words are they using, what makes sense to them. Tailor it to, to fit with what the child and family, what makes sense to them and, and age appropriate. So I think you'd tailor it for sure and you'd engage them in doing that. And you'd be using information you're gathering through that assessment process and tailoring into the plan and then, and then getting parents and teachers on board with that. So I think it's a really essential tool um, to, to develop together and collaboration together and then to review and monitor it and see how it's going, see how useful it is and get the child to have a lot of input. Children having agency is, is really important in, in, at this time, all the time, but in this time particularly. Thank you, Lynn. Um, we're getting some questions around um, children with uh, disability and um, the, the link between um, disability, uh, particularly autism and um, suicidal uh, thoughts. Um, Kim, could you maybe talk about are children with autism um, uh, more, at more at risk um, of suicide ideation? Um, and if so, how, how can they be supported? Thanks, Dan. In terms of my experience with kids on the spectrum, their presentation is usually uh, about emotional dysregulation and aggression towards other people. It's been pretty rare for me to come across a young person who's autistic with suicidal ideation. But I did have a look at the research around suicidality and kids on the spectrum, and it shows that uh, males who have had a history of depression, have increased risk of suicidality and suicide attempts. And the key feature in terms of kids who are autistic is that their social communication competence and their ability to make friends impacts on their suicidal ideation later in life. So. Usually when they're a teenager, they realise that their autism affects their relationships and their friendships and their ability to maintain friendships. And then they might become depressed and then suicidal because of their deficiencies. Thank you, Kim. Um, Zoe from the chat room has asked, are there any particular risk assessments safety plan tools or questionnaires that the panel can re recommend. Um, Ellen, I wonder whether we might start that one with you. I tend to use um, interview. I tend to use interview questions. Uh, so there's no specific um, tool I use now. 
Okay, thank you for that. Um, what about uh, for you, Andrew? Are there any particular tools that uh, have been useful for you in, in your work as a GP? Uh, I've been using the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, which um, has been very useful. Uh, there, there are age categories for that, which can be used for both the parent, the teacher, and the child. Um, and I often get them to fill that out in the waiting room and then bring that in. Um, it can be helpful as well for the parents to fill in something like a DAS 21 or a K10 if they are going to be presenting to me separately because it's helpful to screen them uh, when I see them separately. Um, but the strengths and difficulties is probably one of my favourites. The Spence Anxiety Score is helpful for children as well. I know there are many different tools out there, so I try not to get too overwhelmed with them, but um, they're just a couple to start with. Um, the K10 obviously is a good one for the, the older, um, probably the older teenager and adult um, uh, uh, kids. Mm. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Um, yeah, um, some the, questions the coming in around using. preventative strategies in terms of what can we do as uh, in both families, but also in schools and communities to um, uh, help children, um, to get to children and support children before um, suicidal ideation becomes a factor. Uh, Lynn, I'm wondering whether you might like to comment on that. Thank you, Dan. This is like my favourite favourite question, and a lot of um, a lot of the research is really looking at what is it that we need to do that will prevent us getting to the point of suicide. Um, people having suicidal thoughts and um, action. So I guess the whole a whole school approach is really important. So that sense of belonging, connection is really important. There are theories around suicide that, that people who don't feel like they belong, feel like they're, they're isolated, are at greater risk of, um, of suicide. So let's begin with the belonging, connectedness, um, effective evidence-based responses to bullying in school so that you, you've really got very effective anti-bullying strategies. Bullying is often seen raised as, as the you know, main issue related to, um, to suicide, but it's, it's got to be a whole lot of different things that are coming together. It's not just one thing, but obviously a child who's vulnerable already bullying is going to have a big impact on. So we have to look at all those underlying risks and protective factors, I think. So belonging connectedness in the school, good um, relationships between schools and, and families, and the ability to pick up on things really early, children knowing it's okay to talk about all sorts of feelings that we're not kind of focusing just on, on being happy all the time, which is something that the parents and schools sometimes get caught up in. So if you're feeling upset, you're distressed, you're feeling whatever, all sorts of feelings, who can you talk to about that? What can you do about that? Who can support you and, and support each other? And good social emotional curriculum in schools to, to really support that in an evidence-based way. So explicit teaching and then practice of that. And good relationships between schools and, and health professionals in the community so that if there are concerns that there are really rapid pathways to get some help as early as possible. So I think when we talk about suicide prevention we can talk about it in this holistic, really early preventative way um, and then have responses to when things go wrong. But ideally we get to a point more and more where we, we're sort of catching things much earlier and, and don't kind of get to this point where where we're having to do the prevention in terms of that child being immediately at risk and, and worrying about, about that and the distress that comes from that. That's the short version and I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks, Lynn. Andrew, I wonder whether you might like to comment from a GP perspective given the, the numbers of um, children and their families who, who visit a GP every year. Yeah, thanks, Dan. I guess the GP motto is prevention is better than cure. Um, the whole idea of GP care is to prevent illness. So I think more and more now in GP land, we are becoming more aware of mental illness. It's becoming an increasing part of our work. And um, as part of that, when we see patients for more regular health screening measures, such as health checks, or immunizations, um, or, or regular routine visits, we are more in tune to how their mental health might be going, and particularly in the paediatric setting. So that might be a really important aspect of how we could have or how we could screen for Joshua and his family um, and, and touching base with the family as they come in, um, especially the other siblings as well. Um, and, and I guess that's where prevention comes in. If we can catch these things a little bit earlier, even just a few um, months or weeks earlier, um, could we have stepped in and, and implemented some changes um, 
uh, and and as as Lynn has said, you know that 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 can make a huge difference moving forward. And those changes can be as simple as you know we'll see you we'll see you again a little bit more regularly, um, or involve we'll involve some allied health, um, or we'll we'll send you to somewhere that might help um, uh, some you know get some social input. Um, so I think that you're right with um, with prevention. I think that's really the key in that. Um, in that setting, um, all good in hindsight, but something that we can look for in future planning. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Your point around when do we uh, involve allied health professionals is an interesting one. Ellen, I, I'm wondering whether you could comment on that in terms of what what point would you refer in your role to CAMS or a psychiatrist or to family therapy for a child like Joshua? Uh, with Joshua and Joshua's family, I would err on the side of caution uh, straight away with a child this young with suicidal ideation. Um, I think just touching on what Andrew just said too about prevention, if you look at him, he had a, a build-up of risk factors from about the age of five. Um, as a family, they had a build-up of risk factors considering how his mother uh, had a substance use issue for a while there. Um, so directly involved with what is happening now, I, I would I would do it immediately for further uh, assessment, I think just for safety reasons. Um, but as far as the prevention goes, I think any child or family that comes through to do a, a, a thorough assessment, which is where I spend a little bit of time talking about the family situation, um, major events that have happened, that is where your risk factors perhaps come up, and when you start getting, you know, one or more risk factors, then it just raises a bit of a red flag to think that, uh, you know, this family might need a, a closer look, or um, even just talking about it and raising it as an issue with mum earlier to sort of say, you know, this this is really really stressful and could be impacting um, on your on your children. Just and just give a few pointers on what to look out for. Uh, thank you so much, Ellen. Um, we have a, a question coming through from Lynn um, and Kim. Perhaps you might uh, be able to answer this. Can there be an issue of complex grief that has not been considered? Um, and you know, in your practice, how would children's grief, um, as it uh, is associated to suicidal thoughts, be identified? For me, to go first, or Kim? Yes. Me? Yep, okay. Thanks, Lynn. Yep. Yeah. Look, I, I think um, in the, the case study, certainly um, grief, complex grief, where it's, there's some unresolved issues, can certainly play a role in this. And I think if we do look at the case study and look at the the death when Joshua was five, the death of his dad, Joshua was then put in a, in a position of, of being the, the man about the house, the man of the house, so put into a different role, and then usurped by that role when um, the stepfather came on the scene and, and some other siblings came. So I guess if you think about that from a child's perspective and trying to make sense of what's happened in the family and, and making sense of the death of, um, of his father and that, that whole um, voice that you might have or the way that you can express that, there might have been some concerns around that. And he certainly, we, we know that he did see somebody um, when he was younger with some signs of depression and then didn't, didn't end up finishing that treatment. So I, I think it is really important and I think we have to think about suicide in this very way. So what are all the, what, what's the meaning around it? So if we think about suicidal thoughts and actions as being a way of, a form of communication, if you like, that things are, are, are not good. So psych ache is one of the language, one of the theories um, that we've talked about. So if we're thinking about a child with psych ache, and this is their way of expressing it, it's, it's coming out in this way, I think grief is, is a really important part of that, but then grief and all that goes with it. So it's grief and the loss of the dad, but then the change in the family circumstances, the change in house, the change in connections to others as well. So there's multiple grief and perhaps unresolved, which you could then talk about in terms of complex grief. So I think it's a really important part of this, this whole picture that we're talking about in the case study. Right, thank you, Lynn. Andrew, a question for you. Um, if uh, you had a, client, a child uh, whose client, like Joshua, who was really resistant to engaging um, in care, what, what might you do? What might be some of the, the kind of strategies that you would use? 
Are you referring to resistance to psychology? Yeah. Or, yep. Um, I'd be keen to find out why he's resistant, um, what might be some of the underlying fears he's got, and whether that comes from the previous um, uh, treatment he had with a psychologist um, in terms of what, do, you know, did it, did it not go well? Did he not connect to the psychologist? Did he not have his goals met with the psychologist? Um, or, you know, sometimes it can be as simple as he was um, with an, a psychologist he, he just didn't relate to um, and he just wanted, wants to see someone you know, who matches up to him better and we need to sort of work on that. Or um, it could be that we need to find some some goals that, you know, that he wants to, to go through. And we often, I often ask them, what would you like to get out of your psychology session? You know, is there some, something you feel is really important to you that you'd like to achieve out of these sessions? So, so it can be, it could just be working around some strategies like that. Um, if, it, if, it's not, um, if it's not to do with the dynamics of the psychology sessions, is it, is it broader than that? Is it the type of um, therapy he's getting? And uh, sometimes I switch from, from psychology to occupational therapy. There might be, um, we might need to change things up a little bit and, and utilise some different types of um, treatment on the mental health care plan, as I mentioned earlier. Um, or do we need to look more towards group type therapy and we've got some social skill type treatments, as I said, um, you know, to help him with, with um, how he's feeling with his, with his um, social sort of um, self-esteem at school, which he's struggling with to make friends and dealing with um, how he adapts to school. Or do we need to help him with becoming more positive with his school environment? So um, there could be lots of different factors, and I guess exploring that with, with Joshua and, and what, what is that resistance, what is that barrier to psychology, because that is a really important aspect of getting him treatment that is evidence-based that Kim has said is going to help him um, uh, to be improve and to, to get better. Um, if we can break down that barrier for him, it's going to be an, an important step to recovery. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Ellen, perhaps we've got time for, for a quick comment about that uh, from you. Just wanted to make a, a, a real-life example. Just happened, happened to have something happen today that illustrated why a child wants to drop out during um, treatment. Uh, it was a 12-year-old who mentioned that his father hit him when he was younger. Uh, the response from the psychologist was, I may need to make a mandatory report. Um, and the result was they were in my office seeing me saying, I don't want to go back, um, we'll not talk to this person again, etc., etc." Now, there's many reasons why that sort of comment might have been made, but it sounds to me like it wasn't handled particularly well. Now, we don't know that that happened with Joshua, but we do know that his mum was drinking at the time. Um, if something had come up through his talking to the psychologist and he felt like mum was threatened, it could be an example. So again, just a real life example, just to be aware of when you are talking to young children, how they perceive uh, those sorts of comments. Um, and even if you're thinking it, not necessarily a great idea to, uh, to mention it. Uh, that's about uh, all the time we have for um, uh, chat room questions. So thank you so much for everyone that uh, asked those questions. We had so many great questions that we couldn't get to just uh, because of the volume that we had uh, in the chat room tonight and the number of participants. Um, I'm now going to invite all our uh, presenters just to sum up uh, for, for a couple of minutes with, with final thoughts. Uh, so to start with Lynn, I might ask, your final thoughts for tonight. Okay. Thanks, Dan. I think the first thing is, is listen and take any talk of suicide seriously and see it as an opportunity to understand what's going on for the child and do your planning, safety planning around that. Make sure kids know the helpline, kids' helpline number because they, they need to have a range of options. So ideally they've got people in, um, in their lives that they can talk to and make sure they've got that, that number and that it's okay for them to call that. Um, and just a, a prompt around one of the resources that I think people find really useful is a resource that I wrote. It doesn't have my name on it, but I did the work for Headspace last year and it's in the, on the list of resources and it's um, a Headspace one, Understanding Suicide, Suicide Attempts and Self-Harm in Primary School Aged Children. So I think if there are some other questions, hopefully that, that document might answer some of them. So have a look at that. Thanks. Thanks, Lynn. Um, Andrew? 
Uh, yeah, and I think in summary of mine, it's really engaging Josh early, making him feel welcome in the health setting, um, letting him know he's in a safe space, um, and having that open communication, uh, building that rapport with him, and then creating a great mental health care plan that create, that sets him up with um, appropriate um, allied health professionals that secures his safety and ensuring that he is um, safe and not at risk. Um, and doing that appropriate risk assessment, um, and if if needing get needed, getting follow up um, closely so that we can um, uh, ensure that he is um, followed up appropriately, um, and offering support to the family as well. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Andrew. Um, Kim, some some closing comments from you. Good assessment and formulation should inform your management plan and good communication between the different multidisciplinary uh, clinicians. Make sure that you have consent to send off any important letters or reports. And if in doubt, just pick up the phone and call your local mental health worker and get some advice over them and they can direct you. Thank you, Kim. And Ellen? Yeah, just a point I'd like to make, it would be really great if good information was given by Allied Health to GPs about their interests, their strengths, who they like working with, so that a good referral can be made um, with you know, good information so that more you know, appropriate people are matched with the appropriate young person. So that engagement is so important and if that's not um, expediated properly, then it really slows down treatment. Thank you, Ellen. And I think that's a really good place uh, to finish. Um, I'd, um, I'm sure you all join me in thanking our um, panellists tonight. Um, what is a really kind of challenging topic, but I'm sure you'll all agree that um, all four of our presenters managed to provide uh, collaborative, curious and engagement um, practical um, hints and um, strategies to be able to work with uh, school-aged children and their parents uh, in a preventative uh, way. So thank you very much to all of you. Okay, so that uh, finishes the uh, formal part of tonight's um, webinar. Thanks to the well over 2,000 of you who joined us. Um, don't forget to complete the, the survey feedback. Um, Click the survey feedback uh, tab at the top of your screen to open the survey and uh, we'd really be appreciative of your thoughts of, of tonight's webinar. Um, and don't forget also that MHPN has a, has a great suite of uh, webinars coming up on uh, the 25th of February, which is a Monday night, um, Emerging Minds and MHPN will be presenting on supporting children's mental health after trauma. Um, and then they'll be collaborating to recognise and address the mental health impacts of uh, loneliness on Wednesday the 3rd of April. On March the 13th, there'll be the next DVA webinar on military member to civilian, identity and transition. And on Monday, March 18th, there'll be a webinar on mental illness, terrorism and grievance for fueled violence, understanding the nexus. So I'd just like to say that MHPN supports the engagement and ongoing maintenance of practitioner web networks where clinicians from different disciplines meet regularly with other mental health practitioners, share tips and resources, and build local referral pathways and engage in CPD activities. To learn more about joining MHPN or go to the news section on the website, you can also indicate your interest through our, our exit survey. If you're interested in joining any networks over the holiday break, go to the MH website, MHPN website. And before I close, I'd just like to acknowledge that the consumers and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you to everyone for participating in tonight's webinar. Cheers.